please welcome to the stage, Mary Fisher. I'd always wanted to be a mother, but my skill was less apparent in homemaking than in arranging public events. I arranged fundraisers. I was a television producer arranging morning shows. I worked for the White House, arranging trips for the President of the United States. In the late 1980s, I arranged my wedding with Brian. And on our honeymoon, I became pregnant. Now that's what I call arranging. The marriage had challenges, and the challenges eventually led to divorce. But not until our son Max had a brother, Zach, and I was the mother of two small sons, the joys of my life. Then one bright, sunny day, Brian called. He had news. He had AIDS. Brian had left me with two beautiful sons and one ugly virus. Now what? Given no effective treatment for AIDS, Brian and I were both headed toward hard and certain deaths. He died on Father's Day, 1993. I thought I might have four or five more years with enough health to mother the boys. Then they would become orphans, and I would become a memory. That I am alive to be with you a quarter century later, well, it's a miracle. But an equal miracle is that I now see the brokenness of those days as prelude to the joy that fills my life. If you watch late night television or read the magazines stacked along Meyer's checkout lines, lanes, you'll find a hundred prescriptions for making your life perfect. Lose weight, change jobs, more sex. The message is clear. Take charge of your life and good things will follow. It's all about arranging our lives perfectly. <coughs> but really, it isn't. We can arrange our lives in every imaginable way and bad things still happen. We're chatting on our cell phone while driving to work. A child comes out of nowhere. Twenty years later, we can feel her head hit the fender, feel the right front wheel bounce over her body. Now what? Our husband isn't perfect, but he's loyal, until we learn that he's in his third year of an affair with our best friend. Now what? Our daughter is getting straight A's in college until we get the phone call that said to us she tried to commit suicide. Now what? And between these thundering crises are the little things, the flat tires and the broken egg yolks of life, mistakes and many failures, proof that we're not perfect, and evidence that we are not in control. Here's what you and I both know. We are going to suffer. We are going to get sick, going to weep, going to die. The same is true of our children, no matter how we wish and try to protect them. Bad things are going to happen. How we respond can determine the value of our lives and the joy that we will experience. So, let me offer a short menu of lessons I've gleaned from bad things. The first is perhaps the most obvious. It helps to know that we're not in charge. We are neither the cause of the sun rising above us, nor the cancer striking within us. Most of life is beyond our control. Knowing this will save weeks and months of what have I done and how have I failed and the big one, 
Why me? It answers why me with the simplest truth. Because I'm human. That's all it takes. I've learned that the uselessness and the unattractiveness of self-pity. I understand that some people suffer at the hands of others and are truly victims. Children are abused. Our sister is raped. The shopkeeper is shot so the thief can steal 93 cents. These are victims. We should have mercy on them. But when I define myself as a victim, my life grows narrow and pinched, unhappy, decorated by blame and anger we cannot resolve. From the earliest days of my diagnosis, long before dancing with my son at his Traverse City wedding a few years ago, already then I objected to the label victim. I had and have an illness, actually several, but I'm not helpless and I'm not powerless and I'm not pitiful. As I told a group of Republicans in 1992, I'm not a victim. I'm a messenger. Among the most remarkable lessons we learn in hard times is the value of humor. Suffering is not funny. AIDS and cancer are not amusing. But so long as I remember that I am human, and so are you, there is possibility of humor. We need it. For 20 years, I've told audiences, large and small, the following absolutely true story. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, Bill Clinton's base camp during the 1996 presidential campaign. I'd come to speak at an AIDS event where awards were being given to local leaders. It was no secret that I was the woman who'd spoken at the Republican National Convention. I was probably the only Republican in the room. The top award that evening in Little Rock went to an elderly public health care nurse. Bright, quick, 77 years old, and wonderfully feisty. She bounced up to the podium, took the microphone, and I opened with, and I quote, I've had it with them dumb Republicans. Every politically correct person in the room took a sharp breath as she went on. For 15 years, I've talked to them dumb Republicans. Over and over, I've explained there ain't but three ways you can get AIDS. Swap needles or blood, have sex, or get born with it. And for 15 years, them dumb Republicans kept asking, can't you get it from mosquitoes? I'm telling you all tonight, right now, that from now on, I'm going to tell them, yep, you can get them from mosquitoes. <laughs> but only in three states, Florida, Louisiana, and Arkansas. Because them's the only states mosquitoes grow so big, Republicans can have sex with them. <laughs> I'd not have told the whole truth today if I didn't confess that in dark hours and long nights, I've wondered hard about the issue of cosmic justice. Why do the innocent suffer? Why would my children need to be abandoned? Ironically, it was in asking the why question that my life took on new and important joy. Because instead of looking for meaning, looking for purpose, I began to make meaning in my life. I could not change my AIDS, but I could change my life and perhaps the lives of others. 
if I would only use my experience to offer learning and hope. My brokenness opened me to service and thus to joy. I would never have asked for AIDS. And I do not recall my double mastectomy as a pleasant experience. But both remind me that I am here and I am human for a purpose. And the purpose is to serve others. To find joy, we must look away from ourselves to other. Suffering qualifies me, enriches me, enables me to focus on the suffering of, of others with whom I now identify. By being broken, I am made human, a part of the company of the suffering because all who are human will suffer. When in bad moments I am tempted to think nothing matters, including me, when I am ready to give up or give in and retreat from the world, when I see the children suffering war and the women suffering AIDS, I recall this old Sufi story first told to me somewhere far away. Past the seeker, as he prayed, came the crippled and the beggar and the beaten. And seeing them, the Holy One went down into deep prayer and cried, Great God, how is it that a loving creator can see such things and yet do nothing about them? And out of the long silence, God said, I did do something about them. I made you. Serving so we can find meaning, broken so we can find joy. <laughs>